So what Jodrell Bank's been all about for, for more than 60 years now is exploring the invisible universe. When you go out at night and you look up at the sky, uh, you're using your eyes to look at things there. You'll see stars, you'd see the moon maybe. If you're lucky, you might see something like a comet. Um, and for thousands of years, that's what we were limited to doing, was just using our eyes. About 400 years ago, Galileo first used a telescope. And what the telescope does is it lets us uh, get an enhanced view of things out there in space. So it collects more light, lets us see fainter things, magnifies the view. Um, but visible light, the sort of stuff that your eyes can see, is not the only sort of information that's coming from space. There's a, it's only one part of a huge wide spectrum. It goes all the way from radio waves at one end, um, through infrared, then the visible, and then out beyond that you've got ultraviolet, um, X-rays and, and gamma rays. And these days astronomers would use um, every bit of that spectrum to get us different information about the universe. And the first bit um, of that spectrum to be opened up outside the visible to allow us to look at the invisible universe was, was the radio part of the spectrum. Radio waves are um, they're what's called electromagnetic radiation. They're all part of this big wide electromagnetic spectrum from radio waves at one end to gamma rays at the other and visible light in the middle. And the difference between these different types of radiation is, is what's called the wavelength. They're actually made up of electric and magnetic fields that vary and the distance between the sort of peaks in these fields, that's called the wavelength. Um, and the wavelength of visible light is very small. Uh, it's maybe a millionth of a metre or less. But the wavelength of radio waves is much longer. Um, maybe a few centimetres, 20 centimetres, maybe even a few metres. So it's the wavelength that's the crucial difference between radio waves and visible light. Radio astronomy actually began in, uh, back in the 1930s. The, Carl Jansky, who's an American uh, engineer, um, was studying um, radio waves as part of a, a task involving, you know, using radio waves for terrestrial communications. But he found a source of radio noise that he realised was actually coming from space. Um, so he was the first person to pick up radio waves coming from outer space. Uh, another American called Grote Reber, um, later in the 1930s, built his own little radio telescope in his back garden, actually. And he was the first person to start to map uh, the radio sky. Here at Jodrell Bank observations began in, in late 1945 and so, so we were some of the first pioneers of that, of the new science of radio astronomy. So here at Jodrell Bank there's actually four radio telescopes. There's the big Lovell telescope, um, 76 metres in diameter. When it was built it was the world's largest radio telescope. It's um, still the third largest uh, steerable telescope. There's another large telescope on site called the Mark II telescope um, and together those two uh, work as part of a network of uh, telescopes across the UK, we call it uh, Merlin, which actually combines five remote telescopes with the two large ones here. Um, that acts as a giant telescope spanning the whole width of the UK, gives us a sort of magnified view of what's up there in space, a sort of zoom lens if you like, lets us look at details. And then there's another two smaller telescopes here at Jodrell Bank. Uh, one spends its life um, looking at pulsars, the dead remnants of exploded stars that, that basically ridiculously extreme objects that weigh about as much as the sun but they're only about the size of a city and they spin in some cases hundreds of times a second. And one of the other telescopes, the other small telescope is actually used for teaching um, where we look at uh, hydrogen atoms largely in our own galaxy and we can sort of measure the spiral structure of our own Milky Way galaxy using that. The main problem we have operating uh, radio telescopes is, uh, is the wind. Um, if the wind gets up and a big dish is tipped over and the wind blows into that dish then you actually could risk blowing the whole thing down which you you know you wouldn't want to do so we have to monitor the wind speed and if the wind gets up you have to tip the telescope point it straight upwards and park it so that's the most stable position um, the other issue would be maintenance in the sense that you know radio telescopes can be used 24 hours a day we can observe during the day we can observe during the night principle if, if it's not extreme wind you could use it all the time throughout the year, pretty soon it would start to break down. So we do have to factor in periods of maintenance where we look at the structure, we do sort of essential jobs like painting work and so on. The major discoveries that we've made here with the radio telescopes, um, one, of the, one of the first things we, we found was that looking at the study of these things we call radio stars, which are these really bright radio sources. Um, and 
turned out that many of them, when you say pointed an optical telescope in that direction, and you thought, well, you know, what are we looking at here? Is it a star? Is it a galaxy? Is it a planet? There was nothing obvious there in an optical view. Uh, and it took some time before the nature of those things was really worked out. And here at Jodrell Bank, we pioneered a technique of uh, taking radio telescopes, um, moving them farther and farther away from the big telescope here, um, but combining the signals from the two using radio links. So we actually sent the radio signal from the remote telescope back to Jodrell Bank. And by moving them farther and farther away, we actually zoomed in in more and more detail. And we were able to show that these objects were incredibly tiny. Uh, and as it turns out, these things were what became known as the quasars, the distant galaxies with supermassive black holes. Um, another major area of, of work here has been pulsars. Um, they were first discovered um, by Jocelyn Bell uh, with a radio telescope at Cambridge in 1967. Um, they're actually, when they, they were first discovered, they're this sort of re repeating radio signal, a sort of as this thing, as this neutron star, this spinning neutron star rotates, it flashes much, much like a lighthouse. And so you get this sort of repeating, very periodic flashing pulsating signal hence hence the name pulsar when they were first discovered it was there was a sw slight concern maybe that actually we discovered signals from extraterrestrials so the first one was called lgm1 little green man one um, pretty quickly it was realized that it wasn't that um, it was these these dead remnants of exploded stars um, and the telescope here the level telescope here turned out to be ideal for studying them so that's been a major area of work here ever since and we've discovered uh, many hundreds of, of pulsars, including recently a double pulsar, two pulsars orbiting one another. It's actually provided us with the best ever test of Einstein's theory of gravity, uh, general relativity, um, showing that Einstein's at least 99.95% correct. We're hoping at some point to prove him wrong, but anyway, he's at least 99.95% correct. Uh, another major discovery were things called gravitational lenses. Um, these are, um, it's an effect that was predicted by Einstein uh, with, his, with his theory of gravity, um, where light is actually bent around massive objects. So, so the mass of an object curves space-time, and that means that light gets bent around it. And what a the way a gravitational lens works is that when we look out at, say, a distant quasar, um, and in between us and the quasar there's a, there's a galaxy, a, a source of mass, then the light from that quasar is bent around it. And you can get multiple images of that distant object, much the same way as if you look through your bathroom window, which has got the sort of rippled glass, you'll see distorted images of things out in the garden. We see distorted images of things out in space by the, by the mass that's curving space-time in between uh, us and, and the distant object. So gravitational lenses were discovered in 1979. Um, and perhaps one of the most fundamental things that comes out of radio astronomy is the fading glow of the Big Bang. We, we, we believe that the universe began about 14 billion years ago in the Big Bang, um, and it's been expanding ever since. Galaxies are flying farther and farther away from each other. But when we look out into space, uh, the farther away we look in space, the farther back in time we can see. And actually, the most distant light, and therefore the oldest light, we can ever see is actually something called the cosmic microwave background. It's light that set off uh, in the universe just a few hundred thousand years after the universe began and it's been travel traveling through the universe ever since. But when it set off it was sort of dull orangey red colour. The, the universe was at a temperature of about 3,000 degrees and so it was glowing a sort of dull orangey red. The universe has expanded by about a factor of a thousand since then. And so these, these light waves were sort of stretched to longer and longer wavelengths until now they're in the sort of microwave radio part of the spectrum. And so we can use radio receivers on board on radio telescopes or on board spacecraft, like the Planck spacecraft, uh, and we can study this, uh, this fading glow of the Big Bang and look right back in time, right to very near uh, the beginning of the universe itself and actually study the origins of stars, galaxies and, and in fact ourselves. Mm -hmm.